Well, what I thought it would be interesting to discuss as part of our new series of trialogues, because I think it's an, uh, an issue that more and more people are becoming aware of, uh, is the whole question of uh, skepticism and what I call the balkanization of epistemology. And what I mean by that is that uh, uh, somehow as a part of the agenda of political correctness, it has become uh, not entirely acceptable to criticize or demand uh, substantial evidence or expect people when advancing their speculations to make what used to be called old-fashioned sense. And I think this uh, uh, tolerance of unanchored thought and speculation uh, is uh, confusing the evolutionary progress of discourse. But I'm also aware that uh, if you draw the parameters too tight, the baby goes out with the bathwater, or you become a defender of scientism or some kind of orthodoxy. So in my own Situation. I've been trying to both understand what is strong and uh, to be supported in science and uh, what needs to be criticized and equally to look at the uh, alternatives to science, the counterculture, the new age, and to ask myself what is strong, what serves the evolution of discourse, and what is in fact this type of unanchored thinking that I'm concerned about. Uh, so first, let me talk a little bit about how I see science. If any one of us were to take what is called a scientific approach to many of the phenomena that interest us, uh, psychic pets, the source of the content of the psychedelic experience, etc., etc. If we were to take uh, a hard scientific view of these things, uh, these phenomena which we know exist and which we find rich in implications would simply not be allowed as objects of discourse. They would be ruled out of order. So there's something wrong on one level with scientific, what's called empirical, empiricism, skepticism, positivism, it has different names. Uh, on the other hand, if we go to the other end of the spectrum and are willing to admit the testimony of iridologists, crop circle enthusiasts, victims of alien abduction, those who channel Atlantis, those who suspect undetected planets, those who believe vast alien arcologies uh, dot the plains of Mars and so forth. And pro bono, better get that in. <laughs> yes, pro bono proctologists from other star systems <laughs> making unscheduled house calls uh, uh, late at night in our homes. Uh, I mean, both of you realize, I'm sure, that medical professionals, regardless of their species or star system of origin, do not make house calls anymore. Uh, so, I see then this problem. Science is too tight-fisted. It misses much of what is interesting. To abandon uh, uh, the uh, approach of science is to just be without rudder in an ocean of strident claims and counterclaims, many of which are preposterous and certainly not all of which can be true. So. After thinking about this for a while, my approach was to say, well, science went from superstition to its present positivist position through a process of evolution, temporal unfoldment. So, using a method I've advocated in other situations, I conducted the following exercise. I said, I will move backward through the episode the epistemological history of science to the last same moment science knew and then analyze what that consists of. And uh, I'm not completed 
in this process. But what I find is that a curious betrayal has occurred in science that with the rise of capitalism and industrialism, science has actually become, uh, has allowed assumptions to be made that betrayed its original intent. And what I mean by that is uh, modern science uh, relies on statistical analysis of data. You know, measure 10 times, add the values, divide by 10, this tells you how much rain is falling, how much voltage is flowing through a wire, something like that. Uh, this uh, approach to phenomena mitigates against unusual phenomena. Inevitably. Inevitably, because they are statistically insignificant. That's the phrase that is actually used. So I, we can talk about this in detail. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I think you see my implication that the method of statistical analysis true produces general formalizations of nature's mechanisms and wonderful products which can be sold and patented and so forth but it's a coarse grained view of nature and what it mitigates against seeing are the very things which feed the progress of science, which is the unassimilated phenomena, the unusual data, the peculiar result of an experiment. So looking at that then, I said, well, where are we in the history of science where this happened and how was it before? And you may wish to correct me a hundred years either way, but I'm very interested in sort of uh, bringing back and reappreciating William of Ockham, who, aside from the things I'm saying about him here, which are very nice, also had a notion uh, not much appreciated of what he called unlimited progress. And it comes very close to novelty theories, belief that the universe progresses unto merging, emerging with the nature of God. But the thing about Occam that bears on all this is, of course, his famous razor, which simply says, and it's been interpreted many ways, but hypotheses should not be multiplied without necessity. Or, to put it more simply, the simplest explanation of any phenomena should be preferred until found inadequate. Explanation should not be complexified beyond the demands of the problem against which it's being brought to bear. Uh, this, uh, so what I'm feeling is if we abandon statistical analysis of nature and realize that probably uh, the assumption of temporal invariance that that assumes about the underlying fields of nature is in fact a cheerful assumption, untested and unprovable. So we should get rid, in my hypothetical reformation of epistemological dialogue, we should get rid of statistical analysis. We should dial science back to the late medieval period of Occam. And we should do science that way. And applying Occam's razor, we are quickly able to cut away the underbrush that these peripheral and uh, alternative people have brought to the table. Some of it's good. Uh, things like hypnotism, acupuncture, nutrition therapy, uh, rational approaches to telepathy, clairvoyance. None of this is what I have a problem with. I don't have a problem with people proposing new models of nature. What I have a problem with is uh, unanchored eccentric revelations taking their place at the table. The channelings from the Palladians, for example, uh, the Sitchinite reconstruction of the ancient Near Eastern archaeology, the Arguellian distortion of the Mayan accomplishment. Uh, I find these things uh, pernicious and easily dealt with 
if, if we use Occam's razor. But when we go too far into statistical analysis of nature, then we begin to cut away at our own uh, uh, beliefs and assumptions about nature. Yours, Rupert, of the, of the morphogenetic field, mine of novelty theory, uh, and there must be some aspect of all this that would threaten you, Ralph, if uh, extremely uh, empiricist and positivist criteria were brought to bear. In other words, we've all been called soft in our hmm. time, but in fact, I think we, our softness indicates a failure of science. Science has hoarded itself to the marketplace and to technology and uh, interesting high-order phenomena like societies, economic crashes, complex system behavior um, is going to remain forever blurred in our understanding as long as we rely on statistical analysis. It's a tool that had its place, but to hold on to it indefinitely is going to retard uh, mathematics ability to give a, a deeper account of nature. A perfect example of this, uh, and then I'll stop, would be the enshrinement of the so-called uncertainty principle in physics throughout the 20th century, you know, the supposed great bridge between science and mysticism. Well, it turns out it's just malarkey. There is no uncertainty principle. David Bohm's formulation of the quantum physics gives perfect knowledge of velocity and position without ambiguity. It calls forth the notion of non-locality. That's why the Heisenberg formulation was preferred but again, uh, non-locality accepted permits some of the things we're interested in, telepathy, information from other worlds arriving via the morphogenetic field, um, and so forth and so on. So uh, I haven't been maybe as rabble-rousing as you expected by naming in turn various heresies to be consigned to the flames, but I do think there are too many loose heads in our canoe and that no revolution of human thought that I'm aware of succeeded through uh, fuzzy thinking. Mm. Well, I've certainly got a lot to say about all that. Um, very interesting. I think that the, first of all, we have to see that there's a regional uh, problem here that skepticism and, <coughs> and Occamism and so on occur in different social balances in different parts of the world. You live in Hawaii and visit places like Maui quite frequently. <laughs> to, uh, um, Ralph lives right here in Santa Cruz, California, where you only have to mention the name to anyone in England who knows California at all, and they immediately say, oh yeah, where all the old hippies hang out. And <laughs> It's the kind of, it's a totally alternative place. And as we've seen in our joint appearances in Santa Cruz, there's a level of weirdness among some of the theories people have and the crank obsessions they follow, which from outside the perspective of the West Coast, most people would recognize as typically Californian. There's a, there's a kind of level of weirdness and cults and these, I mean, most of the phenomena you've named a phenomenon of Hawaii and California. When you live in England, things take on a rather different perspective. There's a general level of popular skepticism, such as that the general tone of an English pub is one of sort of skepticism. And well, but aren't crop circles and Graham Hancock all homegrown British phenomena? They are, but every single one of them in any single pub where it's debated would always have skeptics in the, in the discussion. You're never going to have a kind of thing where you have all believers, except in small crank societies of true believers, which exist. But the thing is, the general cultural tone is one of skepticism. And so the need for a great deal more of skepticism doesn't feel quite so urgent if you live in London as it does if you live in Hawaii or California. That's my first point. Um, but secondly, I think that the the, the, the scientific scepticism you talk about is, is indeed a serious threat and I think that's done more than anything to drive science in this direction 
It's a kind of dogmatic skepticism that rules out at any cost weird phenomena like telepathy, non-locality, etc. And so to rule those out, you have to say that a, a lot of phenomena don't really exist, like telepathy and stuff. And, and if non-locality happens, it's just a peculiarity of the details of quantum theory. With no Statistical anomaly gets yes. rid of all problems. So you can, you can take these points of view, um, but the sceptical, those kind of dogmatic sceptics who I find myself confronted with quite often, the sceptical inquirer crowd, who are on my case whenever they can be, because they've classified me with the pro bono proctologists from distant star systems. So the thing is, I've, I've had the experience of being put in that category by sceptics, including the editor of Nature. Um, and uh, the sceptics in Britain who regularly appear and uh, good for a quote any time by the press my old friend Professor Lewis Walcott at any moment and to any journalist several times a year will say can't take this kind of thing so seriously and then last year when he said but Professor Walcott don't you think you should keep an open mind about some of, some of these things he says not so open that your brain drops out <laughs> 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 so that kind of sceptic has done a great deal to force science into this narrow thinking mode. It's forced the investigation of telepathy into more and more ridiculously detailed and unrealistic parapsychology lab experiments seeking to provide the statistical proof of regularities. However, I've, what I've found is with the staring experiments and with the psychic pet experiments, one can achieve results, positive results, which fit with all this normal statistical thing. They're repeatable, positive. They meet all these statistical criteria. They're not evanescent phenomena like human synchronicities. These are regularities of nature. So the old-style statistical approach can actually take us much further, I think. I'm using old-style statistical methods in my own research because... I don't want to change both the content and the style at the same time. You know, I want to show that by the old methods, these are valid criteria. So if I have valid phenomena, they actually happen, and you can prove them in the old style scientific way. Um, but I do agree that the, the kind of discussion we have in science doesn't need to have all these things. What I like most, I think my most heroic example in the kind of thing I do is none other than the great late Charles Darwin and like most other biologists I greatly admire him but what I see in him and admire is different from what others admire I like his um, the way he draws on information from non-professionals plant breeders pigeon fanciers horse, horse trainers and horse, horse trainers um, cabbage breeders rose planters and specialists horticulturalists he draws on all these people's experience, colonial explorers, sailors who tell of feral pigs on remote islands and how they've gone wild and so forth. All this is what Darwin draws on and he discusses it in a common sense way. There's no statistical test, chi-squared test, 5% levels of probability. It's wonderful science. It draws on experience and treats it in the light of common sense using rules of evidence, but without rigid... Uh, statistical test rigid methods and it's wonderful science he discovered a great deal he'd never heard of 5% levels of probability and yet it's great science so I think that the, the there is a possibility to return to a more common sense approach and common sense of the British pub type and probably of standard American kind too will often deal quite satisfactorily with the pro bono proctologists from outer space anyone who claimed that in the British pub would be this would be the butt of a great deal of humour within minutes and... Uh, no the pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, it, let me just say about that, there is a political problem. Uh, you're right, though the British have this reputation in America for being the epitome of politeness. Actually, in a British pub, people are willing to blow the whistle on uh, what they perceive as absurdity. By jokes, yes. always with humor. In the New Age, it is a utterly humorless, and the reigning paradigm of political correctness demands that you treat 
all of these testimonies and bits of news with complete equanimity. And it's thought to be rather out of sorts to suggest that anybody uh, shouldn't be taken seriously. The belief is uh, that truth can't be known, and so all there is is opinion. So, you know, you speak from your knowledge of the calculus and world history, and this person speaks from uh, their latest transmission from fallen Atlantis, and this is all placed on an, an equal footing. And it's crazy making, and it also guarantees the trivialness of the entire enterprise. I mean, I just don't think any revolution in human history can be made by fluffheads. Well, I think we, in order to understand what you're saying, I, I have to really try to figure out what a fluffhead is. Yes. I mean, this, this is the crux. I like your um, historical approach, as we agree that science is rather in bad place now. We can look back, find where it went wrong, go back there, start over again. This is exactly what fundamentalists do. They say, yeah, our ethics are gone, so we're going to go back to the first speeches of Muhammad or something. So, um, William of Ockham, I, I, I feel uncomfortable with uh, his idea of uh, simplicity. I mean, the modern form is probably Kolmogorov's measure of complexity, which would be, given a data set, what is the, the length in bytes of the smallest computer program that can approximate the data set within epsilon or something like that. And the problem with this, technically speaking, is that um, last year's technology would give a Kolmogorov measure of this much. This year's technology would give a much smaller measure because we've learned a new trick of building models, or it may only depend upon the computer language, more or less, that's used to build the model. So, in, in other words, that there is no simple measuring stick of simplicity. And given three explanations, we're not sure what is the simplest one. There's no mathematics that could really be applied. It becomes a subjective judgment. And therefore, I think that this whole question where uh, I think that you've suggested a one-dimensional scale of fluffheadness, the kind of fluff scale, where down at this end, we have what uh, even um, uh, Walpert thinks is okay. And over at that end, we have the, uh, the, the test that can be applied to Pleiadians to see if they're real or not. So in, in this scale, I think you've marked two points. There's the point at which you think to the right of this is too fluffy and to the left is okay. And then there's a, 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 another point where science agrees it's okay. You see that you're ruling out like the channeling, no, but the telepathy, okay. But Walter says the morphogenetic fields is not okay, but DNA is okay. So I'm thinking of these two points that you described as being on some linear scale mm -hmm. of fluffness. And I'm thinking that this entire scale of fluffness is not, I mean, you'd like to appeal to mathematics and to some kind of real science, that there is a real science that the the community or the religion of science has gotten off the track of the real science and that there this is what bothers me and I wish that this were true but I have no faith in it that there is somewhere in the sky or in the deepest uh, bowels of the earth a measuring stick where we could somehow measure the truth of something even if it's just a degree of truth as in, you know in chaos logic you don't have true and false you have a truth is a percentage between zero and a hundred percent and is only chaos logic would be a good alternative for you um, the truth of a proposition let's say a formal logic like Zeno's paradox is only a temporal assessment and is the input of the measuring stick of truth after which we get another measurement. You see, so now under what we know so far, it's 60% true. Now, we assume that it's 60% true, that's the input to another assessment. Then we find out it's 66% true. And without the input of another assessment, then it's 64% true. Hopefully this 
process of successive judgments, which could be regarded as the history of science from the past through William Malcolm on into the infinite future, would converge on something. But uh, in chaotic logic, it doesn't converge because certain kind of propositions, which are circular in a way, like Zeno's paradox, they, uh, in circling around, they have a chaotic attractor, and so they're always giving different results, never settles down, it gives a dense set of estimates between zero and a hundred percent. And from this perspective, which is the successor of Aristotelian logic, which served science up until the year 1985 or something, um, you, you can't have a clear measuring stick of truth, and you can't have a clear scale of fluff. And so the attempt to make something perfectly clear might be doomed to failure. We understand it then as something psychological. So I just want to give a... I'm, I'm, I'm applying uh, Ludwig Fleck here to you. And uh, Ludwig, Ludwig Fleck is the founder of the sociology of science, where you sort of do Freudian analysis of the scientific community as, is, as a social, as, as a flock of sheep, as it were. And with, uh, like in the 60s, we were, as parents, very uh, libertine with our children. Now we see those children have grown up, and my, my children are having children, and they're, they're like much stricter. And there's the idea that in successive generations, people are more or less strict with their children. And I think they're more or less strict about fluff also. So the fluff scale is actually a sociological aspect of a given culture or civilization, which fluctuates wildly in time, and I think that this is just one of many theories uh, for you personally, and maybe uh, we are also affected by this, that as we age, and then we are in contact with young people, and then we are receiving input from them, as far as the, the morphogenetic sequence of a fluff scale is concerned, uh, that we're affected by them and we're becoming a little more critical. You see, so then we become critical of ourselves in a way because a decade ago we were more open. So our fluff scale is changing, and therefore we um, have to rearrange all our, our social grid. That some some people that were previously okay are now too fluffy for us. So their brains have fallen out. Well, let me say a couple of things about this. First of all, I think I agree with almost everything you say. Um, on the end of pointing out that its truth is a very difficult thing to assess, you didn't mention Kurt Gödel, but certainly his proof that uh, no formal system produces all true statements um, shows that even ordinary arithmetic is subject to debate and represents a kind of circularity. So on one end, I completely agree with you that truth is a very complicated concept, and why shouldn't it be? It's motivated thinkers since thinking began. Uh, and we're, we as yet have no certain index for it. You mentioned that you thought my approach was one-dimensional, and I agreed from your example. Uh, but much of your criticism was was couched in the vocabulary of symbolic logic, analytical deconstruction. Here's a way we might go at this. Agreeing that it's a messy problem, let's agree that the solution may also be somewhat messy. So, for instance, we perhaps need to talk about kinds of fluff. I immediately identify two kinds of fluff. Uh, one is uh, unscientific speculation, persistent throughout history and with a consistent uh, provenance. I.e. religion. Well, but mythology. I wasn't going to attack religion. I was thinking of more marginal ideas, but religion is a good example. I was going to th suggest alchemy. 
alchemy believes certain things about matter which science absolutely abhors and rejects. The history of alchemy is far older than the history of science. It has always been in existence. Its thinkers have always evolved and adumbrated their field of concerns. So that's one kind of fluff. Fluff with punch because it has historical continuity. But what are we to make of someone who brings to the idea a complete cosmological model generated in the past 10 years by themselves alone. They never read Plato. They know no mathematics. They never read the Bible. They never read Wittgenstein. They just got it all in one download. And it is, uh, on the face of it, preposterous. It's a faith that tells you that vegetables lose their auric fields unless peeled with wooden implements, that uh, major earth changes uh, have already happened but are invisible to most people, that there are only 100 real people alive on the planet anyway, everyone else is a, a simulacrum from another dimension. In other words, preposterous on the face of it, Historyless, idiosyncratic, and utterly unanchored to any body of, of uh, previous human thought, sanctioned or unsanctioned. So the question before us is how do we distinguish all these books from one that superficially might appear to be in that genre, the invisible landscape? How do we make a division between the invisible landscape on the one hand and the rest on the other? (laughs) The invisible landscape, the category of the invisible landscape is uh, I Ching commentary. I were writing one right now. Well, they've been, the I Ching is a legitimate object of speculative discourse has been since pre-Han time. Okay, so let's say we accept a two-dimensional model for fluff, where there's deeper fluff, like Yijin commentaries, and more superficial fluff, like the entire manifest universe is the circulation of a single electron. Uh, let's use whatever. the Urantia book as an example. So in this the case... Uh, or the pattern we were given last night, as a, a spiral the form of the basis of the I have one here. Made of wire. So I think that... Um, I, I'll give you a point here, in that uh, Occam's razor is uh, intuitively a good way to describe this new dimension. The, the simpler and more complicated explanations for an effect which is a matter of fact not established um, so th- this is my worry about um, the anti fluff posture that you now project in public and so on uh, I'm sympathetic with a lot of things and we're worried greatly about the pattern and, and uh, the, 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 the problem with this um, strict parent approach to fluff is <laughs> <laughs> is that some important discoveries may be shuttled aside as Walford uh, shoves aside Rupert's idea of the border genetic field uh, what is it that science hates, hates besides Rupert uh, science hates homeopathy uh, acupuncture or alternative medicine altogether. Science hates uh, cold fusion. I mean, there are certain things that say, well, you know, too open-minded. To even think about things, too open-minded, too, too much in conflict. So a lot of things would have been missed. You think of these paradigm shifts uh, of the past of science. For example, the continental drift or the ice ages. I can see, I mean, all this, this was a really terrific discovery of mountain climbing guides of the uh, ice age theory that we don't take for granted, rejected by science for 30 or 40 years, and um, is one of the few successful examples of a paradigm shift in science. This scientific community Brilliant. is so I never even thought of it as a paradigm shift. So oh, it's a terrific story. I tell in great detail in my book, mm-hmm. Guy Arras, including the heroic picture of Agassiz. Mm-hmm. And 
himself. He was taken into the mountains by these uh, peridon, or mountain climbing guide, and said, you look here at the Jura mountains, the limestone mountains, what are these hunks of granite doing here? They've been brought here from over there, where we know where the granite is. And <coughs> Wonderful you, you, story. You mentioned 30 or 40 years, Ralph. I think po- one way of thinking about this problem is uh, a some school of fluff should be given a certain amount of time to advance their agenda against very very messy. But if after 20, 30, 40 years they've gotten nowhere, they should not lose their place in the discourse or move to the back of the room or something. And I think this should be applied to science as well. For example, science has been beating its breast since 1950 about how they were about to elucidate the mechanism of memory. I think it's time to just pull the plug on it. <laughs> You've had 50 years to flail at this with every tool available, and you have zilch to show for it. Similarly, if the good, the, the flying, the people who believe aliens from other star systems are visiting this planet with great plans for mankind. They've been running that rift since 1947. It's time for them to lower their voices and uh, let other people have uh, something to say. Well, maybe a century or two. Why are you so tight? Because if there is no progress, there are other fields have created multiple revolutions no, in the same, same time scale. Progress is is um, very subtle. So while looking for memory and grains in the grain, they didn't find them, but they did figure out how to do a certain kind of surgery so that if you have um, you know a tumor or something, they can do a really good job of helping you out. So. Well, I would challenge you to make a list of spin-off effects from the New Age that have eased the suffering of mankind. Uh, uh, I mean, there have been a few back scratchers and some nutritional supplements and uh, a mantra or two. But in terms of the money consumed, the lives distorted, the hypola that we've all had to put up with, uh, the feel, posturing, we feel the censorship. I, I think, okay, if we were the National um, Science Foundation and we'd been funding channelers for years, hoping that they would find gold in South America, then I mean, we might withdraw our funding at this point, but we, we, we can't make it illegal somehow mm-hmm. for them to... Channel. No, no, what so we have to legitimize is critical discussion so that when someone stands up and starts talking about the face on Mars, people behave as they apparently behave in British pubs and just stand up and say, malarkey, mate, and, you know, force people to experience uh, uh, a critical deconstruction of their ideas. The face on Mars thing is a perfect example. Here in, what, 76, Voyager sends a low-resolution image. Might be a face. All of these self-promoting so-called ex-NASA scientists. I mean, when I hear the phrase ex-NASA scientist in the New Age, I reach for my revolver. So all of these ex-NASA scientists gather around, proclaim this thing, an alien artifact, when the first Mars orbiter fails at orbital injection around Mars, they scream conspiracy. Mankind isn't ready for the truth. Eighteen months later, the second Martian orbiter goes into orbit flawlessly. NASA, responding to the previous hullabaloo, actually moves this site up in its photographic agenda uh, photographs it exactly under the conditions these people say it must be photographed on. It's clearly an eroded uh, mesa, part of the Martian landscape, no different from any other. And immediately the face on Mars people scream uh, that the data has been tampered with, 
that all but kinds of terrible things have gone yes. on. One guy sent me email saying, well, it is, there isn't a face on Mars, but there will be in the future. Well, and someone yeah. else wrote me and said, well, obviously, the aliens wouldn't leave an artifact. The face on Mars is cleverly disguised as an eroded mesa. Well, I agree, but it, I, I'm not sure that it's good to rant against the face on Mars, because there's no way by uh, William of Ockham or whatever that you could have ruled out the possibility that there was really a pocket watch on Mars and now in fact they do like there, there's life here and there there's water on the moon there's a pocket watch on Mars there's not a face on Mars but there's something uh, that nobody suspected that was found by going there so my fear is that by drawing the line too tight that many discoveries will be um, missed, they'll be missed, and that a certain amount of open-mindedness is necessary to, um, for novelty to come in and to nourish the evolution of, of the collective mind. And I've got an answer to this, a political answer, because however much we choose to make criteria or define what, we'd have no power whatever to enforce them, unless we were on a funding committee of the National Science Foundation or the government or the British Medical Research Council or we were an editor of a prominent journal like Nature or Science and so forth. Under those conditions through controlling grants or through controlling editorial policies of major journals you really shape and influence the science community. You are the ones that draw the line about what papers are published in Nature. I mean, people like Sir John Maddox who opposed my work, declared in public, in an editorial, this work, seemingly scientific by someone with seeming scientific credentials, etc., was actually outside the possible area of rational scientific discourse. So there was a line drawn, uh, 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 put on an index. So there are people who do that, but we're not in those positions, nor are people in those positions very likely to listen to what we say. So the realistic question is how in fact does all this work and, and, and how politically could the system be reformed here I rely on a book by a dissident Cambridge biochemist um, who wrote a book um, called the, the Economic Laws of Scientific Research and his name I forget but I, I remember it but anyway in this book he shows that if you look at the structure of scientific research funding you find that in the 19th century when there was a great deal of scientific creativity and originality in both Britain and America there was um, a great diversity of sources of funding there was very little public money in science, practically none and it came from uh, innovators, companies that needed to do the science in order to make the chemicals and stuff no one was going to tell them or give them they had to do this engineering research, a study of the Adam Smith study of the Industrial Revolution in Lancashire found that the improvements in spinning jennies and steam-driven machinery came not from experts, not from mathematicians, but it was mostly done by illiterate technicians who were improving the machines that they ran and understood from day to day, the mechanics. And this innovation was mechanic. New technology came from old technology. Science had nothing to do with it. He shows if you study the history of technology, most of it, most new technologies have arisen in this way. Science was funded by a diversity of bodies and was quite diverse. On the continent, in Germany and France, where they had centrally state-controlled policies in the 19th century, the universities were funded by the state and there was a ministry of science and they had central institutes. It was highly professionalized and institutionalized with professors with great power. In Britain and America at that period, there was actually no science in universities. And now, after the Second World War, the biggest change happened after the Second World War, when people like Vannemar Bush got the idea of a military-industrial complex with big science, huge government funding for defense research, which linked in the universities to a huge government-funded program of research. And then with the National Science Foundation, this model was extended to medicine. But the primary one is the military research budget, billions and billions of dollars driving research in laboratories, Los Alamos, you know, Lawrence Livermore, and so forth, all around the United States and in the major contracts with universities. Then you have a centralized system of science funding 
through, uh, we have it in Britain through research councils, central government research councils, which define spending for engineering research, sociology research, medical research, who gets the grants. And these are run by small committees of professors and experts, you know, people like Edward Teller are on these committees. And they decide the science funding, the structure of what's permitted and funded through the whole system of the system. This imposes a kind of monopoly control, a kind of uniformity of thought, which is the enemy of deviant thinking that doesn't fit within that system, however well or badly the lines are drawn, you can't do anything that's not within the centre. The only answer to this, he suggests, because he's an Adam Smith follower, is not to follow Bacon's idea, which is Francis Bacon's vision was central government, government spending, you know, an academy of scientists, state owned, like a sort of state priesthood of scientists, and then they think of new ideas which then go to the mechanics to turn into new technologies and science fuels this progress. He shows that in fact technology fuels technology. Science hasn't got that much to do with it. If you look at different science spending in different advanced countries, pure science as such has not that much to do with it. But the pure science people have to do it on the centralised funding programme in accordance with defence aims, the war against cancer, AIDS, you know, all the great agendas set by centralised science, molecular biology and biotechnology now taking over the life sciences. The only answer in practice is a free market answer. Whether you abolish or greatly reduce central government spending, science is then paid for in accordance with enough lobby, any interest group that's got enough lobbying power would vie for it. There's a huge organic um, consuming community they'd lobby for money to be spent on organic farming research. So the president gets practically nothing because it's not part of the central agricultural research program geared towards Monsanto chemicals and so forth. So if you, in fact, this central monopolistic legacy of the Baconian heritage, which is really what he was the Lord Chancellor of England, it's an old style monarchical church and state a top-down hierarchical structure run by a small elite accountable to nobody whose these priority if, if priorities were set by popular opinion pet research would be top of the biological agenda not the sequencing of more proteins the cloning of more sheep um, to help the biotechnology industry but instead pet research isn't even on the agenda so it's set by a small elite who bear no relation in their interest to the voters in a democracy who actually provide the money. But on the other hand, you would have then the astronomical budget would be entirely spent looking for UFOs. No, it wouldn't, because if you had, it, you would give, you'd have some kind of funding agency which would give matching grants to organizations. If a UFO organization applies for a grant for UFO research, you'd have a sort of advanced funding agency which could fund this kind of thing. You'd have, if you had a central funding agency, it would be ha either have many more subdivisions or sub-offices, or would have a great deal more, less hierarchical structure. It would be done on a regional basis, a state basis. They, anything to allow for quirkiness and deviation and, and multiplicity of decision making. But all of these would be answerable. If you got you a grant for your UFO project for five years, you got $50,000 a year for five years or something. At the end of the five years, you submit a report, and this is published in scientific journals, which are open to this kind of thing, like the Journal of Scientific Exploration. It will publish scientific papers on, on the face on Mars. But anyone can write in and say why they think this isn't good enough evidence, and the debate's there in the journal. And you can see both sides of the young. They do this. They've done the face on Mars. Then the new evidence, someone then publishes a new picture, the new evidence of the face on Mars, and the person who wrote the original can, can write a reply. But for most people, a kind of new consensus would develop, that there isn't much in it. Well, one of the things I've noticed in talking to people about these problems is that pseudoscience is very difficult for most people to discern. In other words, if you dig into the face on Mars problem, 
you'll find all kinds of articles with pretentious titles about information theory and uh, uh, higher dimensional reconstructions of the data so that before the spacecraft arrived we supposedly had uh, terrain models of what it was going to see based on extrapolation of the early yes. data and well, inevitably these people are all PhDs and they use these technical languages very um, adroitly so uh, you know along with the idea that there should be some kind of historical continuity and I agree diversifying the hierarchical spending patterns would help the other thing is there needs to be some way of, uh, and this has never been done in science because I guess it was never necessary because the collegial atmosphere was self-policing, uh, but there should be a way of looking at the messenger. Well, I'm not very keen on your messenger point because it leads to ad hominem arguments. You see, the, the classic thing you should avoid in proper rational discourse traditionally is ad hominem arguments, attacking the messenger and not the message. And ad hominem attacks, where people who say things that you don't like, they can be destroyed by smear campaigns, like Randy trying to smear Geller, or Geller hitting back by saying Randy is a pederast and a pedophile and a totally dishonest and disreputable character pervert and so on. And this kind of ad hominem argument is all too common in practice. When Randy attacks Geller on the ad hominem grounds, look at the messenger, a guy who was on did cheap music hall acts in Israel and stuff, and then comes, he's just a showman. He hits back, you see, but that's where you get with ad hominem arguments. You get Geller and Randy. And Randy's supposed to be a rationalist. Uh, well, it's a problem. I mean, I would like to know these things about someone I was debating but I agree with you it's not a valid point to bring forward but if for example you're dealing with a, a supposed guru but you know that he's done time for fraud embezzlement and auto theft I think that in a debate about his theology that would not be proper to bring forward but on the other hand you certainly would want to know that W yes, but it, no, it is a, then you, you get the kind of the worst kind of prurient prop, popular press ad hominem attack where anyone in public life immediately they're going to find out if they've got mistresses, illegitimate children and blaze this stuff all over the papers. That means that people in public life, politicians and so on, the slightest sexual affair, etc., now becomes enormous. I mean, Clinton, no one outside America can believe this fascination with whether or not there's no fascination. 72% of the people would like to get on with it. You see, exactly. it is but so moving coup d'etat driven by religious maniacs of the extreme. I don't think right. it's a religious mania. I think there's some kind of, this kind of ad hominem business. It's the stuff of popular TV, the press, etc., etc. There's too much of it in the modern world. Well, it would mean you don't it's believe so it's capable, I think. Uh, I mean, the monopolistic control of the financing of scientific research worldwide is bad and it's important and so on. Nevertheless, the National Science Foundation does rely on the judgment of these uh, peer reviewers and group of experts and so on. Finally, it's their opinions that direct the flow of money and that would also be true if uh, there was no central control and had every industry um, financing its own research. Actually, yes, there is you'd, you'd get more opinions. The cat That's food the industry, there are two or three companies that are outstanding for their research on the dietary needs of, of cats and dogs, and they do this research based on funds that are coming in from pet owners and mm. so on. This is the 19th century model. It still yes. exists to a degree. And even in those companies, there's a group of people who are deciding how to spend their money. And maybe they're influenced by the criminal records of some of the researchers and, and so on. But finally, it's the opinion of any, even a person in the street with a dollar to give to the March of Dimes or something. It, it's, uh, it's a question of opinion, and that's where Ludwig Fleck comes in, the sociology of science. These journals are important. What you can publish, what, that's why we don't like censorship. People should at least be able to voice their theory about the face on Mars or whatever the pattern and so on. 
So it's, I think, very important who can publish and not publish in, in magazines like Magical Blend. And even if we aren't on uh, committees of the National Science Foundation, if we do speak and give opinions about these magazines and so on, then we're affecting their editorial policies. How do they decide whether to publish these articles or not? The hope that there is some measuring stick of truth that you could be clear-headed, like to use like Aristotelian logic or something, want to be clear-headed, it's very hard to to distinguish. We do not have a science, as a matter of fact, that allows us to distinguish um, one theory versus another Occam's razor or any other way. We don't have. Finally, we're going to use our intuition, and may, we may take into account arguments uh, ad hominem while um, doing so secretly, of course, and while saying the opposite, we nevertheless consider the gender and, and so on. So uh, I, I don't th- th- this is what's worried me about things like crop circles, the pattern, and so on. I do not stand up and speak against them because I do not trust my own bias against them. It could be true. A new face on Mars could be discovered. A, a channel con- containing um, a quartz a crystal watch could be found under the left paw of the Sphinx. I mean, I'm not sure that these claims are not true. I think they're not very simple. There's some things that aren't interesting. I don't care if there's face on Mars or not. I do think the age of the Chops Pyramid is, is kind of an interesting question because um, the whole skeleton of history, as Newton wrote a book called The um, Chronology of Ancient Kingdoms Amended, was interested in getting the chronology of the Old Testament into the proper order and, and so on. Well, I think we're all interested in these things. Uh, the thing is not to be led astray by people who have, for whatever reason, a different notion of evidence, a different notion of truth than we do. Well, um, the medical profession, I think that the, you know, it's based on good science and so on. Now, I believe in vitamin C. I don't believe in it, but I have. You know, I take vitamin C. I took some today. Ten years ago, my doctor, the best doctor I had, told me that vitamin C was hogwash. It was just like morphogenetic fields to him. Yeah. Now he believes in it. What's happened, it took a while to accumulate enough, not evidence, enough convergence of opinion, enough consensus, really, that he could have faith in it among the people who were there. Question authority, that's the point. Something that is making the conversation difficult, and it has to do with... Question authority, that's the point. Something that is making the conversation difficult, and it has to do with propositions such as vitamin C is good for you, may or may not be true and people of good faith may differ but when someone says people were cloned in vats 12,000 years ago and placed here by the denizens of an invisible 12th planet that's a different kind of proposition than that vitamin C is I agree with you I think you have a good point there yes but what it, I think the way to the, I mean I, I believe in this area diversity and free market approach is fine I think what I do to denizen the people who have that belief is if I in so far as I had funds and had any research responsibilities and so on in that area I'd commission a review by somebody based in Santa Cruz uh, he'd, his first thing would be to leaf through the, um, the, the common ground catalogue and just look at what's available of, of theories of where we came from. There's hundreds of them in that catalogue. The index of advertisers really runs over pages. Just start right there and then do a review article with all these different theories classified, a kind of taxonomy of crank theories in a given field. Then one would see, then you'd have a sort of summary at the end, and you could have a sort of audience ratings within this class of theories. This would be sort of a national non science foundation. Yes. And, uh, and it's you, called speculation, I was told. Well, I think it's a huge field, and it's in bookstores now. Yes. It's speculation. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> I, have our books been created uh, <laughs> <laughs> yet? Some have, some haven't. Now take your work with angels, for example. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was shocked, shocked. Now we're getting personal. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, there you are. You see, there. I think a lot of my enterprises would fall foul if, if, if you had editorial control. I think I'd rather quail at the thought of sending them to your editorial desk because. I'm not sure. Your judgment would be so capricious. I'd never know quite what mood you were in, whether or not my work on angels would get the imprimatur or not. Well, it does. My consent that unfortunately our press is rather. It's, a, it's deeper fluff. It's deeper fluff, perhaps more pernicious fluff. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Zechariah Sitchin at least made a claim for deeper fluff in his translation in his apparently uh, uh, learning, gaining the ability to um, translate the Sumerian cuneiform writings and uh, give us fresh translations and interpretations of old texts and so on. He was at least making a claim for deep fluff, and you're denying him that claim. So even there, it's hard to locate a given exemplar in the two-dimensional scale of fluff that we've agreed. Well, but his, his cosmology calls for a twelfth planet. Where is it? There's a site on the internet that claims that every 100 inch or more telescope on Earth is under the control of a worldwide conspiracy that does not want you to know that this 12th planet is clearly visible. Now, that's where I blow the whistle. Well, that's, but you don't need to do that. We just need a sophisticated, we need an cons- existing mechanism to extend it, a consumer's report on speculation books. And in this consumer's report, you'd have, it would be like consumer's reports on washing machines and so on. You'd have this theory here, and then you'd have a series of columns that said, any improbable requirement, mm. and then you'd have requires twelfth planet in this mm. column. There'd be yes. a lot of that, <laughs> <laughs> and then, <laughs> then it would say, uh, then the next column evidence for special requirement, yes. and then for some of the, 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 some, the, the some of small of it, and then it'd say none known, and so on. Well, you know, I think that's marvelous, and you could do the Zetetic and Microsoft, and not with you know, concentrate on the New Age exclusively, all of these institutions are extraordinarily improbable. You know, Paul Feyerabend, in a wonderful essay in his book Against Method, points out that 95% of the scientists who have rejected astrology cannot cast a natal horoscope and that the ability to actually cast a horoscope never seemed to be required of these high-toned scientific critics of astrology. It was something they felt perfectly free to dismiss without understanding. Quite, but you see this should be the same, there has to be this dismissal level that we all operate where there's certain things we pay attention to and certain ones we don't. Um, in my case, you know, I, I include UFOs. I don't include UFOs. I include telepathy and so forth. When it gets to UFOs, weird extraterrestrial chariots, conspiracy theories, the CIA, I turn off. I mean, there may be UFOs, but it's not something I take any interest in, really. Um, although I meet many people who tell me I should. So I think we all have our own criteria here, and, and opinions vary, times change, and so on. Well, the hypothesis of causative formation, of course, favors deeper fluff. Deeper fluff. Uh, for example, uh, astrology, which I think is very interesting, I, I think it's quite valid to reject it on scientific grounds without being personally able to cast a horoscope. Anyway, you can consult the World Wide Web and get a horoscope from any date and place. So, uh, the thing about astrology is uh, people say it works, and an argument could be made that even though the zodiacal reference frame that it's based on has no longer any basis in the sky, that it works because people believe in it, because it's in the M field, and it, because it's deeper fluff, basically. Homeopathy it's could be an example of a naked morphogenetic it. field. Mm. Nothing but belief. Yeah. That is very recent, started very recently. It must have built up this field very rapidly because for mm. a short time they did extensive research. And I think it could be that scientific research done according to the best principles has a greater weight 
in impressing itself upon the morphogenetic field or something. And the, the racial memory but, but is... This is actually a radical form of relativism because what you're saying is if enough people believed in the Urantia book, it would be true. Yes. No. Not. Not no. true. Work. It would work. Astrology works for people. Okay, alchemy no longer works because people stop believing in it because of but probably the real truth is that astrology works for the people it works for and the people it doesn't work for and never mention it and have moved on to something else. Well, there's extensive research oh, I in agree. It astrology has that passes all the tests of uh, statistical significance and so on. Well, well, there's some, but I mean, the, the reason people believe in it in newspapers and magazines and, and astrologers and so on is nothing to do with that evidence. They use it as no, a kind of background to do with reinforcement. Astrology, really. and it's, say, yeah, I wouldn't call that astrology. No. Well, you see, I, I think that we, you could apply this, this approach of uh, this consumer type evaluation approach to different sciences too. And you know my latest thing in the Skeptical Inquirer, what I'm trying to do is extend the skepticism to the sciences themselves, and there's a very interesting paper in the current issue of the Journal of the History of Medicine on the history of double-blind techniques. Double-blind techniques were invented by Benjamin Franklin in Paris in about 1890, and they were investigated as Franklin was commissioned by, by uh, the king, Louis XVI, to head up a royal commission to investigate the claims of Anton Mesmer and the whole of Paris was talking about mesmerism, the whole of Europe was talking about mesmerism, animal magnetism and so on and Franklin and the members of the Royal Commission were firmly of the opinion that this was some kind of delusion that people believed in this but it, it might just be a product of their mind or their belief and so in order to test this they developed blind methodologies where people didn't know who'd been treated or who hadn't and they're, they're, their blind methodologies actually involved blindfolds, and that's why they're called blind. Hmm. They blindfolded people and then saw hmm. if they could still tell or detect the animal magnetism. Hmm. And often they couldn't. So the blind techniques were then later employed in the 19th century. They then became starts the standard armamentarium of the skeptics against these marginal phenomena, first applied to hypnotism and animal magnetism, uh, mesmerism. Then they were implied, uh, in the 19th century, they were applied against homeopo homeopathic claims. People said it's all just suggestion. It's all just their belief. And so to test that, they already with this precedent, they used blind techniques. And some of them, I think, did turn out to be suggestion, but some were not. And the homeopaths took seriously this criticism. And for they were the first group in the whole of, med of scientific research to internalize blind techniques by running their own blind trials. They didn't just have the skeptical attack, they internalized it. Mm -hmm. This kind of debate went on in the earlier parts of this century against a lot of medical cures and claims, some of them apparently respectable, the use of enzymes that would cure this or that. You know. um, and some of these were totally phony. How did you tell? It wasn't until after the Second World War that the standard randomized double-blind clinical trial became the norm in medical mm. research, and it didn't really become widespread until the 50s or 60s. So this is another case of blind techniques being internalized. Within psychology at the beginning of the century, when they were studying phenomena of the mind known to be subject to distortion, blind techniques were used in psychology. They were used in parapsychology in the 1880s. They, they, they had the same thing and they started using them. The result of my survey of blind techniques published in General Scientific Exploration and, and summarized in the, in the Skeptical Inquirer shows that this internalization of the use of blind techniques has in fact gone furthest in parapsychology. 85% of published experiments are double blind in recent journals. In medicine and psychology, where everyone pays lip service to the idea of blind techniques, in practice, the number of blind papers, or double blind, uh, is in the region of 6 to 7% of all published papers in the top journals. In, the, in British medical journals, it's about 6%. In the American ones, it's higher. I've just done a review of Annals of Internal Medicine, the New England Journal of Medicine, 
and the American Journal of Medicine, where the percentage of blind or double blind trials is close to 20%. But that still leaves 80% of the papers not blind. Now, in biology, the number of blind papers out of over 900 reviewed is 0.7%. In the physical sciences, chemistry, um, physics, in organic and organic chemistry and physics, the number of blind papers out of hundreds of papers reviewed is precisely zero, zero percent. We then interviewed top professors in the leading departments of uh, the physics, chemistry, biology, molecular biology department at Cambridge and Oxford and other universities. And there, most people in physics and chemistry departments neither use nor teach blind techniques. They're just not used, they're not known. In some physiology departments they do, in some they don't. In psychology departments, of course, they do. In medical, they teach them at least. But at the most of science is totally innocent of the idea of blind techniques. The idea of scientific objectivity, so biased, so unlevel as the scientific faith on which modern science rests, is that just because they're scientists in these areas, they believe that by putting on a white coat, they become completely objective, not subject to the biases that bias chemists, uh, that bias. Uh, medical people, patients, ordinary people, observers of phenomena, where everybody is. They're objective, true, and so I think that a scientific investigation of this, I suggest using, te checking out blind techniques in the laboratory, do you get different results in a physics experiment if you do it blind compared with doing it under open conditions? Actually do it by experiment. Does it happen? That so biased has been this that there's no scepticism being extended to normal science itself. And in my consumer's report on different sciences, I'd have a column, blind awareness of need for blind methodology, use of blind methodology, percentage of papers using blind methodology. And in physics and chemistry, the awareness of the possibility of bias would be, have to be practically zero. And probably in the new age as well, they both could profit from this. It would probably wipe out most of the things mm -hmm. I'm objecting to. Well, the to. popularity of uh, double-blind methodology in parapsychology is obviously due to the difficulty of convincing people of the validity of the results. And in other words, under the uh, special weight of skepticism that's applied to the special fringe of speculation. So somehow there's a fundamental dialectic of the evolutionary mind <clears throat> that has to do with the balance and interplay between speculation and skepticism. These are the two forces at work and we want them to both be healthy and freely interplay and then if a new technique like double blind experimental work comes up then the um, interplay of these forces will guarantee that it's used. So maybe, uh, Terence, that you're, uh, to summarize your case against the new, new Age fuzz, is that there seems to be an area in the evolving mind where the speculation is not balanced by an appropriate amount of skepticism. You want to shine a flashlight of skeptical consideration onto that area of unbalanced fuzz. We're interested in balanced fuzz here. Well, speculation and uh, skepticism begin to sound like uh, novelty and habit. So maybe these things are just counterflows in the intellectual life of the culture that redress each other. And though we do have certain long-running forms of fuzz, it does tend to correct itself. Uh, over time, but we are seeing in the present historical moment an incredible fragmentation, syncretic theorizing, and uh, a, a richness of ideological competition that is just perhaps slightly overripe, but due shortly to uh, self-correct. Mm -hmm. oh, well, I, what I see is on the fringes a, a whole lot of small cults, like in California, all vying for space in Common Ground magazine, um, where you've got a huge competing market. What's keeping all those in check is competition. I and mean, if one cult does particularly well, it grows. Others fade away if they don't get enough supporters. If people, this, there's a free market in these products. And there's a great deal of competition. And people who believe in 
pro, what, do, what are they, a pro bono proctologist from distant star systems may not believe in some of the 12 existence of the 12th planet and are often in fact opposed to these other cults. So there is, there's no uniformity, there's a free market, in fact a rabble of clamour of competing claims. On, that's on the fringes. The, the main ground is, uh, is occupied by a kind of Stalinist central control of all government funding and official science, which excludes this stuff. Mm-hmm. I think that, as I suggested before, this, the, a real free market approach opening up, getting rid of this monopolistic control, which forces people out onto the margins, would allow a more informed debate. And I think there's plenty of skepticism around. The fact that these crazy California and Hawaiian cults are not reported daily in the New York Times is because the people who run the New York Times are sceptical. And a lot of the gatekeepers of the major organs of our culture are extremely sceptical, and I would say in some cases excessively sceptical of these things. It's not just the science community, it's the kind of hard-nosed New York Times editor community too. And in Britain, most of our newspapers have that not quite as hard as and they're slightly better at, I think, allowing the unusual in. But the fact is that there's, in the mainstream of our culture, scepticism reigns supreme, and these things are actually forced to the geographical fringes, like California and Hawaii. And you, got, and you happen to live in that ecosystem of competing cults, etc. I live more in the world where scepticism is the dominant paradigm. So that there's a, a kind of bloom of superficial fluff now is merely a symptom of the rigidity of this um, monopolistic control system. Well, I think it means that it's forced into this kind of fringe loony community. Mm-hmm. If these things were able to compete in the open marketplace much more, I, ordinary skepticism, common sense. Common sense I take not just to be our own individual common sense, but a sense held in common. In other words, a kind of common, a consensus view of what makes sense and what doesn't. And this changes with time. And it's hard to document because common sense fluctuates the subgroups and subcultures with different common sense. But this is what's actually the opinion that peer review committees are designed to constitute within that subculture. That's the common sense. This is worth funding and that's rubbish. I mean, that's... it's. So it's the evolution of common sense, and I think that would be influenced by these players of habit, which common sense is generally conservative and, and novelty. And we've got that going on all the time, and I don't think that much of what we do or say about what ought or ought not to happen or propose criteria by which we have a fantasy of ourselves as editors of some jet science fiction. I think we've got a wrap here on fluff, honestly. I think we've completed a more or less Fluffian model for um, a bloom of fluff at this time. I'm not sure there is a bloom of fluff because there's always been, like in Norman Cohn's book on millenarianism, you read all these uh, uh, lunatic cults over centuries with Emperor Jones and people killing themselves and this, uh, these uh, gas people in Japan and, and, and so on. I, I don't know if it's... The, the, the fringe is larger now than before percentage-wise, or I think the, the publishing or less. industry would tell you that it's an incredible bubble fluff at the moment. The a bubble in, in the popularity of and fluff and popularity and, and yeah. public interest. And, and that could have to do with the lo- loss of uh, public faith in science. And yeah. public faith in traditional religion. And, Which and is the other ingredient in the rise of fluff. Yes. New kinds of people are making their voices heard. Uh, people from outside the male patriarchal uh, uh, usual membership in the club. And so they bring different uh, value systems and different notions of what constitutes truth and insight. Uh, people from outside Western cultures and uh, dare we say it Gambers. women women yes. I mean there is it's not for nothing that the word mysticism is occasionally paired with the word menopausal hmm. never heard of that yes but uh, I think in the complete we've we've, we've had another five minutes as sure. you like yeah yes. we can always edit I think in in 
I think that the, again the free competition is the only answer because you have these different products, these different claims and it is actually in the end sorted out by market forces New Age has a big publishing thing traditionally with religions you had competition between different sects and if you have this thing you have mutual criticism it's been impossible in Europe since the Reformation to believe wholeheartedly the claims of the Pope without question because there's a whole group of people whose entire institutional structure, the Protestants is designed to question and reject them and in almost every do- issue of Christian doctrine, there's a set that affirms and another that disputes it. So there's a wide range of opinion, as there is in Hinduism, many schools of thought, Buddhism, different schools of thought. But I'm, I'm a little surprised because you seem to be implying that here is yet another area where the solution to all problems is the practice of untrammeled capitalism and the unleashing of unrestrained market forces. No. Welcome to the new millennium. Well, how, how diff- in England, where other, the Church of England is an established church, but there were Methodist, Baptist, Congregations, Presbyterians, etc., Spiritualists, Unitarians. As in America, I mean, we exported this diversity to the United States. It was founded in the midst of this efflorescence of religious diversity in England after the Reformation. The result of this was that they did compete, not through market forces in the normal sense, but they're competing for followers. And if the Baptists grow at the expense of the Congregationalists, they become more powerful. But all of these have been based on a kind of competition, different claims, and a kind of scepticism, because if it didn't come from within that group or church or sect, it would come from other ones about them. Mm -hmm. And in politics, you have this institutionalized. If you have two or more parties, their job is to be skeptical of the claims of the other. In law courts, we have the adversarial system where you have prosecution and defense, whose job it is to be skeptical of the other. In most walks of life, skepticism is normal. We expect it in politics, courts of law, etc. Journalism. Journalists are more influenced by politicians and courts of law than they are by scientists or the New Age. And there, the general rule is rules of evidence. Here, both sides of the argument. That's the norm, the human norm. It's only in science that anyone can imagine that you could have a sort of total pyramid of a hierarchical system of truth, textbooks or in schools all teaching the same stuff, the basic consensus view. It's like the church before the Reformation. And I think that's the problem, that because of that, we then have a fringe of sects and cults, like you did around the edges. You know, this is the Reformation model here is quite a relevant one. I think since the Reformation, this greater diversity has meant that no absolute claim by any church is going to go unchallenged, even by other Christians. And so skepticism and hearing different sides of the argument are built into our social model about religion. We know there are different religions on offer, different brands of Christianity, in some sense in competition with each other. And this is a much healthier situation than just having a single one. In science, because there's no way of these sects around the fringes ever re- achieving recognition, even if they were remarkably successful, take years and years and years before they'd ever get an NSF grant, generations. That there's a, the, I, I, I come back to this idea that dissolving central control in your line would probably be bad because you're speaking in terms of rejecting relativism in favour of some kind of absolutism, which is the alternative. I think it's still based on a kind of Baconian model of some kind of central control of science and thought. Mm. But the reality is that that situation doesn't exist today. It exists only in science. It's the only relic of that old world view. It's the only universal system which is not open to the normal processes of challenge from competing points of view having to justify itself in terms of evidence and so on. This is almost the definition of science somehow that it's to be an alternative to the diversity that has been experienced in world cultural history in the sphere of religion that very early on people knew that in every town they had different gods and that was expected because there was no uh, um, burden of the belief in monotheism and therefore of uh, religion as, as far as um, theogony is concerned had multiplicity of gods and goddesses 
and principles and spirits and forces and angels and so on, and this multiplicity was acceptable, even though some people thought their gods were more powerful than the gods of the other ones. They agree that we've got a lot of gods and probably there are other ones, and so everything fit together in a context of diversity. Well, early marketers uh, brought the news that gods weren't saying the same things in well, they every didn't say place, the same things, and, and so that launched skepticism. Some said it would happen in 2012, and others in 2013. But uh, the, the fact is that science appealed to people who had lost faith in religion because there was the, I think, now pretty well dashed hope that there could be a unique global planetary system of thought in which it's established the truth of everything relative to other things. And that's why it would be possible, many people would think it appropriate that there's a monopolistic control of the funding in scientific research because each thing is going to be supposedly to reinforce, validate, and confirm everything else because it's the idea of scientific truth. Now, I think uh, the idea of a free market in science would have to require giving up the idea that there is some kind of absolute scientific truth and that a given question would be settled either true or false according to this universal canon. And uh, I don't believe in this idea. I think that's why I, I think that's why a free market in scientific research would be good. However, uh, I think that T Terence, your insistence on clear thinking uh, represents a a deep wish that there could be some um, more or less universal body of truth that we are expanding in the evolution of mind by testing um, testing new speculations for fuzz and saying eventually after at least 30 or 40 years of research that it is or isn't fuzz, that is to say is consistent with a formal system of logic, a kind of mathematical Aristotelian system of truth that is consistent with the objects, provable, theorem is true or is false, and so on. And this is the, I think, the, a kind of thinking which is now outdated and I hope which it would be very, very nice if true, but it's simply not something that we can really expect in any reasonable amount of time. You know, there are there are inconsistencies, and furthermore, we're used to we used to accepting them. So um, it could be that if science was liberalized in this way and was released from the yoke of Aristotelian logic and, and proof and statistical significance on the level of 100 percent then it would become very much like religion, where you would have uh, groups like Anabaptists and, and Hindus and Shivites and so on, who would believe in this or that sub-logical system. And Environmentalists they would be one such group. Yes. Hmm. And, and you have to wonder if this kind of diversity is going to be acceptable by this uh, human species in the future or not? And what's the alternative? Are there some kind of death of the evolution of the mind? In the, in the dead end road of a logical system, belief in a consistency of a logical system which is actually not consistent. He just joined us today's topic is my father is evil and he wants to take over the world. Okay, let's meet Scott Evil. Hi, Scott. It's nice to have you with us. Thanks, uh, sir. Tell us about your father. Um, well, my dad is the head of a worldwide evil organization with uh, aspirations of world domination. Wow, pretty serious stuff. Where is he now? Um, he's like cryogenically frozen, orbiting the Earth or something. That's what you think. But we have a surprise for you, Scott. Okay, let's bring out Scott's father, Dr. Evil. General, we've got a situation here. What is it, Sergeant? Hello, Scott. Daddy's back. How could you do this to me on national television? We're throwing me a freaking bone here, Scott. 
Why'd you run out on me? Because you're not quite evil enough. Well, it's true. You're quasi-evil. You're semi-evil. You're the margarine of evil. You're the Diet Coke of evil. Just one calorie, not evil enough. What are you, some kind of freak? Hey, shut up! Okay, okay, come on. I'll kick you in. Bring it on, you stinky! No one talks to my son like that. It's okay, Spike. You mother f***ing piece of s***. You say s***. You say s***. Yeah, f***. You say s***. You're burning your mother's s***. I'm okay. I'm okay. All right, you're burning your mother's s***. It's okay, it's okay, okay, okay. Come on, come on, it's only a television show. Calm down. All right. Okay, I'm all right. Fight. Okay, I'm okay, everything okay. Okay. All right, get this jerk out of here. I'll give you a piece of <laughs> <laughs> Oh!